Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, Michael LaPerry. Uh, I'm the, my wife and I, Heather, who's on here as well, are the owners of the Century 21 in town realty offices in Vancouver. We've got uh, Yale Town. We have Coal Harbor. We, we have about uh, 130 plus agents working out of here. And our friend and one of our co-realtors, Michael Booth, told us that uh, you wanted to come in and say say a couple of uh, 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 positive words for our province. And we're really honored to have you here. And thank you so much for our audience. I sent out an invite to um, uh, to our fellow Century 21 brokers in BC. Uh, some of them have you on a... Uh, in their boardrooms so there's 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 groups of them here um all i ask for everybody is if when you're on here to keep your uh zoom on mute please if you have a question we'll take questions at the end let let kevin uh, talk about his platform and himself and obviously let's all be nice right this is uh it's this is, he's got a tough job ahead and 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 I want to keep this positive as well because I think that's very respectable. Um, so anyway, we'll we'll start it, Kevin. It's it's your sure. time valuable, and so is ours, and so is everybody else's that that's on here. Um, quick introduction: Michael Booth in our office uh, introduced us uh, to Kevin, who is the leader of BC United. Uh, so we're honored to have him here. Um, I'm. I'm really honored that the parties want to talk to us as being real estate professionals. We have 29,000 licenses in this province, and we have 26,000 of those that are active. And we average between 73,000 to 125,000 real estate transactions on the MLS every year. So you double those numbers, and those are buyers and sellers that we have direct communication with. So... We're a voice. We're as big as a voice in an industry as what BC has. So I think it's important for us to understand what are all these parties' platforms. And, and, I, and I think that we have a listening problem being in our industry is we, we're not really paying attention as so much as what we should. And now is more. it's more important today based on how our country is being run, how our provinces and the, and our municipalities that we have a strong voice to talk about what our needs and wants are and what our customers needs and wants are and how we want to feel safe and being taken care of in this province. So how's that for an introduction Kevin and I'll let you I'll let you have at it and thank you and welcome to this to our meeting. Sure, thank you uh, Michael, I appreciate it and thanks to all of you. I know you're all uh, busy people and you've got lots of things to do and uh, hopefully the market's treating you well. Um, let me just start by giving you a very, very brief background on, on Kevin Falcon. So um, I first ran, I was elected as the youngest uh, cabinet minister in the, in the Gordon Campbell government back in 2001. I served until 2012 where I announced my resignation. Um, not really, res yeah, I guess resignation. I resigned as um, uh, Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance and announced that I wouldn't be running again in the next election. And I did that because my eldest daughter was uh, Josephine at that time was not quite two years old. And my uh, wife was pregnant with our second daughter, Rose, uh, both of whom today are 14 and 11. And um, I went back into the private sector, just so you know, I was in the real estate uh, development business. I was an executive vice president with Anthem Properties. Some of you will probably know Anthem. Um, I like to point out that in the 10 years that I was with Anthem, we built more housing in one company than the entire province of British Columbia did. Uh, with all of their uh, attempts to try and get so-called affordable housing built. So um, why did I come back? I came back because I was very concerned uh, about the direction the, the province was going in. I'd always hoped that when the NDP got elected in 2017, they would be sort of a different NDP, different than the old one uh, back in the 90s that uh, you know took our economy to a very bad place. Those of you, uh, of you that are old enough might remember um, we had people fleeing BC, going to Alberta. We had the highest taxes in North America. Uh, they doubled the debt and on and on. They ran deficits eight out of the 10 years they were there. So um, what I'm seeing right now uh, fills me with a lot of concern. And it ought to concern all of you too. I know when you're busy with your everyday lives, you might not think about it. But I just want people to really understand there is a massive disconnect between what government is spending and the debt they're running up and the actual outcomes that we're seeing. 
Now, just to let you know, BC United, because you might not remember that name, you might think, what the heck is this? What's this United thing? It's the BC Liberal Party. We used to be called BC Liberals. We rebranded the party name to be BC United because we wanted to make sure we were the coalition similar to what BC Liberals were, similar to what social credit used to be back in the day, where people, regardless of how they vote federally, whether liberal or conservative, could provincially come together under this umbrella, this coalition, to defeat the NDP. Uh, just to you know, uh, bring you all up to uh, speed on, on that. So um, where are we at and why is this important? Well, the government just introduced a budget. You may have seen it just over a week ago. Uh, in, in all my years in the private sector and as a former finance minister in BC, this is probably the most reckless, irresponsible budget I have ever seen. Why do I say that? Well, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the debt, you should know this, that in 2017, when the BC Liberal government handed off the government to the NDP, because they managed to pull together a minority government with the support of a couple of Green Party members, a few Green Party members, um, at that point, we had left them with a multi-billion dollar surplus budget, a AAA credit rating, which is the best you can absolutely get, and uh, you know all kinds of uh, good financial picture. Um, the total debt in the province at that point was about $50 billion, which sounds like a lot, but in relation to the size of our GDP, it was actually one of the lowest levels of debt to GDP. So in other words, the it's kind of like having a $50,000 mortgage on a half a million dollar home, right? It's very manageable. Um, and that was the accumulated debt since Confederation. 150 years it took us to get 150, or sorry, to get $50 billion of debt. In seven short years, the NDP more than doubled that debt to 103 billion. And over the next three years, they plan on increasing that by another 64 billion. Now, you couple that with the fact that the deficit they projected is almost $8 billion. That is the largest deficit in the history of the province of British Columbia. That means they're spending $8 billion more than they plan on taking in. And they've got planned deficits for as far as the eye can see. Now, here's what really concerns me. It's not just a whole bunch of reckless spending. It's the fact that we're getting the worst results we've ever seen. Healthcare today, the worst it's ever been. One in five British Columbians can access a family doctor. If they go to a walk-in clinic, they are facing the longest walk-in clinic wait times in the entire country. We are sending cancer patients south to Bellingham to get basic radiation treatment because they can't do it here. That's the that's never happened before in British Columbia, except for the last time the NDP were in power in the 1990s. That was the last time we were sending people south to Bellingham. It is a self-manufactured crisis of incompetent management. Then you look at crime in the streets. It's never been worse. Four people a day being assaulted by random strangers in the city of Vancouver. We've got a catch and release uh, program under the NDP where people that are arrested are released off in the same day. There's a sense out there amongst the criminal underclass that there's um, impunity. There's not going to be a consequence to bad behavior. That's a very bad message to send out. Um, housing, an area that you're all interested in. Look, we've ended up after seven years of this government with the most expensive housing in North America, the highest average rents in the entire country. Okay, those are not good results. Now, they can do this and point blame here, there, and everywhere. But at the end of the day, they've got to own the fact that up until about six months ago, they were doing very little to actually deal with it. All they did was add a whole bunch of taxes, which many of you would know about, uh, onto the real estate business, whether it was the empty home tax, the so-called speculation tax, which I've been arguing for two years, has nothing to do with speculation. Uh, it has to do with people that own second properties. Two thirds of them are British Columbians. And uh, that the NDP used to attack me, say, oh, he doesn't, he supports speculators. And I would just point out, no, I'm just pointing out that that has nothing to do with speculation. That's just been confirmed, by the way, because now EB is introducing a new tax called an anti-flipping tax. And I said at the time, I thought we already had a speculation tax. Now you're bringing in another tax, you know, and on and on it goes. The school tax, which is really an asset tax for properties over $3 million. Um, I can see them, frankly, in their next term, God forbid, if they get in, they will take that asset tax and they will move it all the way down to uh, all. I think they'll cover all uh, properties because they're going to be desperate for money. Um, so we're getting very, very bad results there. I can talk about what I'd do differently. Um, very quickly, having spent 10 years in the real estate sector, I understand this business. 
we've got a group of people in Victoria, none of whom have any background in home building or development or real estate. Um, it's quite shocking. None, most of them don't have any private sector uh, experience. Most of them come from a union background. And that's not bad or anything. It's just that they don't have the skill set necessary to understand how to fix a problem that they can't begin to understand how the problem got there in the first place. And so what we're going to do is some really innovative stuff. And I've announced part one of our housing plan already. And I've said essentially four key elements to that. Number one, we eliminate the property transfer tax for all first-time buyers up to a million dollars. They shouldn't be paying any property transfer tax. Number two, we're going to scrap the provincial sales tax on all new housing developments, whether it's rental or market condos or townhomes, whatever the case may be. And the reason we're doing that is because I keep reminding this government, if you want more affordable housing, you have to make it less expensive. You can't just keep layering on costs. And having been in the development business, I can tell you it is not uncommon for a tower that you're trying to build to have millions of dollars of provincial sales tax embedded in all the costs that go into building that. Uh, the third thing I said is that we would take public land uh, and make it available to the private sector and the not-for-profit sector and provide them a 99-year lease at a buck a year and say, go in there and start building us market rental. In return, we're going to ask that it be rented out at below market rates and we'll negotiate those deals uh, with the uh, development community or the not-for-profit community to make sure that we get new rental supply that's going to be affordable so that our first responders, our restaurant workers, et cetera, can afford to live in communities throughout the Lower Mainland. And the final piece, the part I'm most excited about, is something that I call rent to own. Rent to own is a concept that says we're going to ask the development community to reserve 15% of their uh, available product that they build and make it available for first time buyers. And the first time buyers essentially enter into a three year contract. So it's like a three year close where they move into the property, they will pay market rent to live in a similar property. So in other words, if they were paying say 3000 a month, which is your average rent for a one bedroom in Vancouver, if a couple was paying 3000 a month, they would now move into their new place. They sign their deal, they secure their price. The deal doesn't close for three years. They still pay 3000 a month, but instead of it going to a landlord somewhere, the $3,000 a month goes directly towards their down payment. So that at the end of that three year period, they've got over $100,000 uh, in place as a down payment. And now they can uh, you know, close on the property and they've already been income tested to uh, qualify for a mortgage. So it's a way of uh, very quickly scaling an opportunity to get first time buyers into housing and overcoming the big, biggest obstacle they face, which is of course, uh, the down payments. I want to quickly, I'm going to keep it mostly focused to housing just because that's your, your bailiwick. Um, you, the NDP also brought in restrictions to short-term rentals, as you know. Um, once again, uh, very poorly thought out piece of legislation by people that have no experience. Um, we tried to put forward some very common sense amendments to make sure that we don't impact the movie industry, for example, which regularly comes to British Columbia. They like to rent homes. Uh, or townhomes uh, for a lot of their actors, et cetera, that are going to be spending months here and bring their families along often. They don't want to live in hotels uh, and we don't have enough hotel rooms. Um, they ignored that. We said they should grandfather it for those that are purpose-built short-term rentals. They're all over the place in Victoria, Parksville, Vernon, Kelowna. Um, they wouldn't listen to that. So we now have, we're going to, you just trust me on this one. Uh, because they don't understand supply and demand, which is why we've ended up with the most expensive housing in North America, they're going to create the same problem with their one size fits all, um, you know, getting rid of all short term rentals. They're going to have to back down. I, I guarantee you they will. They're going to start making exemptions uh, just because we don't have the hotel rooms to be able to look after all the people coming. So I'll give you two quick examples. Taylor Swift. My daughters are very excited about Taylor Swift coming here. So are people across the province and around the world, frankly, we're going to have almost 300,000 people over two nights descend on Vancouver uh, looking to attend that concert, many of them from outside of the lower mainland. They'll be looking for hotel rooms and already they're being quoted hotel room rates of over $2,200 a night to stay at a day's inn uh, in, in Vancouver, just to give you an idea of uh, what supply demand pressures are going to do. So you know, we've also got FIFA World Cup coming here in 2026. What are we going to do with all these people coming here? We don't have the hotel rooms. 
the hotels are going to be like over three thousand dollars a night and uh, people have nowhere to stay so it's, it's this kind of very very poorly thought out um uh policies that are going to create worse outcomes and then they're going to stand there and wonder why things are getting even worse in bc so i think it's important i say this all the time i think it's important that we have some people in government that actually understand housing david eb has never worked in the private sector hasn't got a clue what he's doing He's taken advice from a former mayor of uh, Victoria, who's one of the worst mayors I've ever seen. Victoria is a disaster. Um, that's his housing advisor. She hasn't spent five minutes working in the private sector in the housing in, in the housing business. And that's the brain trust in which they are making housing policy. Why does that affect you? Well, because what's happening now, as they've introduced or increased 30 new taxes in BC, uh, business is feeling squeezed. We're seeing young people now for the first time since the 1990s, we've got more people leaving BC than coming into BC from other provinces. That's called out-migration. We still have international people coming here, but the problem is our working age folks are moving to Alberta and to a lesser extent Ontario. Why? Because they can't afford to live here. This is the most unaffordable province in the entire country, not just the housing, but you know our Gas taxes are the are, are sorry our gas prices are the highest in North America. Um, you know grocery prices are expensive. Everything is expensive in BC, and young people are voting with their feet, and that concerns me a lot because we want to have those people staying here. We want to have uh, people feeling positive about the future of BC. The final thing I'll say, and then I just want to open up to questions because it's way more fun that way, is there are three major projects going on in BC right now. These are three of the largest projects in the history of the province. Um, one of them is Site C Dam. The second one is the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And the third is the uh, LNG Canada project. Together, those three projects represent almost um, anywhere between 80 to $100 billion of capital investment. They've employed tens of thousands of British Columbians, all earning well into six-figure incomes. These are really, really important jobs. They're really important for the economy. But all three of these projects are defined by two characteristics that are really important for you to know. The first is they were all started by a BC Liberal, now called BC United Government, okay? All three of them. In fact, I was there in 2010 with Gordon Campbell in Fort St. John when we announced we were gonna build the Site C Dam in the teeth of opposition. And that's the other characteristic about these three projects. All three of them were opposed by this current NDP government, they were then the opposition. And I just, I say that because I want you to think about something for a moment. Think about the fact if they had been in government, we would not have those three projects today, 100%. They even, even after they took over power in 2017 and over four and a half billion had already been spent on Site C, they took a year to decide whether it'd even continue with that project. That's how completely crazy they are when it comes to understanding business finance and the importance of thinking about the next generation. Thank God the bureaucrats convinced them to go forward and, and let them know that maybe wasting four and a half billion dollars of tax money wouldn't be a good idea to have a half built dam. So they did go ahead with it. But, you know, just imagine if we didn't have Site C coming on stream uh, by late this year, where would we be? Um, you know, imagine if we didn't have uh, LNG, that project that is going to be starting to ship later this year, um, three vessels a week that are worth over 100 million each in LNG being exported to Asia. That's a huge opportunity for British Columbia. And so too with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. They wonder why we have the highest gas prices. And when the only pipeline we have from Alberta to the lower mainland, want, they wanna triple the size of that pipeline. And what does the government do? They take them to court, sue them and do everything they can to stop them. But the real concern is as those three projects are winding down and they are all winding down almost simultaneously, uh, there's not three big ones behind them. In fact, there's not even one. And that really worries me because I can tell you those projects have floated our economy for the last six, seven years. And uh, when they disappear, it's going to be a big hit to our GDP. And the fact that there's not any other major investments looking to BC right now should concern all of you because it will have a knock-on impact on the real estate industry for sure. And um, I think with that, I will stop and open it up michael to any questions you might have i'll let anybody uh start i have a few questions but i'd like to open it to the floor first so i don't talk my, myself out anybody i have a question please 
Um, thank you for being here today, Kevin. That's fascinating. And uh, thank you for referencing um, Anthem, definitely my most favorite developer. Not that they do nothing but great things. Um, my great. question, I might be a little naive, but I've always, all my years in real estate, I've always wondered, what is the annual amount that uh, the government receives in property transfer tax? I do a little exercise and try to calculate a month when I see sales, but I'd love to know in the last year or last two years, what is that actual amount that the government collects in property transfer tax and where does it go? Does it just go into general revenue or is it set aside to do something about our housing crisis? No, it goes into general revenue. It, it represents, I could double check on the budget, but it's about $2 billion a year. And, um, you know, as I've often said, um, you know, we we have to, and I this didn't get as much attention when I announced the scrapping of the property transfer tax for first-time home buyers up to a million dollars. But I also said we would review um, the the current levels that in which it applies, because I think we we have to take a good hard look at that. It hasn't been uh, re-examined since 2018, and uh, we all know what real estate prices have done. But look, I think that you know the thing to understand uh, here is that government doesn't have a revenue problem; it's got a spending problem. And that's what concerns me the most. Uh, the run-up in the debt bothers me because the fourth largest spending item in government right now behind healthcare, education, and social services is actually servicing the provincial debt. And that's really unfortunate because that's money that if the government had just been a little more fiscally responsible on their spending and had tied spending to outcomes, which they never do, because I really care about results. And so I want to make sure that the spending we're doing is getting the improved outcomes. And if they're not, then you have to do things differently. They don't do any of that. They just keep doubling down on their spending and hope for a different result. And um, uh, that that doesn't work out for us. Anybody else? Uh, well, yeah, well, well, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I've got a real quick one here for you. Uh, again, welcome, Kevin. For, I know you're probably... Uh, putting in 25 hours a day in a 24 hour day. Um, it's it, when you brought up the site C and LNG and pipeline, we seem to have a bit of a environmental tyrant sitting in Ottawa with the name of Gilbo. Um, what's your plan on handling that guy? Because he seems to want us to get back to riding chuck wagons and living in log cabins if, if you know, in, in a very odd way of, of saying it, but he is, um, he seems to be a bit scary at times and everybody, nobody seems to challenge that. Any views on that with projects coming up or, um, you know, all the trucks will be battery operated in 10 years. Good luck with that. Um, but any, any, any just thoughts on that, just general thoughts on, on where the federal government is trying to uh, throw their net. Well, it's federal and, and provincial, quite frankly. I, and look, let me back up. I, what I, what I care about, I'm a business person. I care about results. That's what I honestly care about. And so if we're, if we're getting good results, that's a good thing. If we're not, then we have to examine what we're doing. Now, the NDP, just so everyone knows here, they have a they have an environmental plan called Clean BC. We call it Kill BC because this is a plan. And I, I was actually quite shocked when, when I read it. I didn't believe it at first. But apparently when they issued their glossy brochure saying what a great, you know, we're just going to have this wonderful green place in BC, et cetera, they unfortunately accidentally left a link in there that went to their own economic modeling. So they hired a company to do the modeling to say, what will it take for us to achieve our target of 40% emission reductions in the next six years? Because that's what they want to do here in BC. And what their own economic modeling showed, by the way, I apologize for the background noise. That's me. If you hear some drilling, there's a bit of work being done on our, our roof here. Um, but so, so what happened is, um, they, they have this plan. They said they're going to do a 40% reduction in, in uh, emissions in BC in six years. Their own economic modeling showed that to achieve that, we're going to have to shrink the GDP, which is our economy, by 10%. And just so everyone knows, that would mean the loss of 200,000 jobs. And it would mean there would be no more investment in any major projects in the oil and gas sector, the forestry sector, anything that's going to have, have emissions. Now, so... I ask myself this question, what are we trying to achieve here? I think what we're trying to achieve is we want to see a global reduction in emissions. BC can make a contribution towards that for sure, but we have to be realistic. We represent 0.17% of global emissions so that British Columbia on its own will make no difference. 
But if we can take something we have a lot of called natural gas, liquefy it into liquefied natural gas and export that to a place like China, which is using coal fired power for most of its energy, that coal fired power is the dirtiest form of emissions. And just by having them switch over to using LNG, which is ethically produced here in British Columbia, and it's not perfect because it's still a fossil fuel, but it will reduce China's emissions by 50%, okay? 50% is massive. It would be like parking every car in Canada permanently, okay? To me, that's a meaningful result, and that's something that we should do. The second thing is when the government says, as they have in BC and federally say, we want everyone driving electric cars by 2035. Okay, well, here's the problem. A lot of people can't afford 70 or $80,000 for an electric vehicle, especially low-income folks. Many of your clients that are trying to save up for a down payment can't afford to buy an expensive vehicle like that. And why is government saying you must do this and you must do it within the next six years? This makes no sense to me. So we are going to have to have some common sense as we go forward. I want to have a clean, beautiful environment too. We're all British Columbians. We love living here. There's a reason we love living here. But I'm going to be focusing on what we can do practically. That means investing in rapid transit projects like I did when I built the Canada line and the Evergreen line. Those are the kind of things that get hundreds of thousands of people a day out of cars and into transit. That's a good thing. We'll focus on things like that. We'll export our LNG to the world, to Japan, to Europe, to China, to India, and help them transition and, and make a big contribution to lowering um, uh, global emissions. So, you know, to me, Mike, it's all about common sense. And, and what we've got right now is a complete lack of common sense at the federal level and the provincial level conspiring together to destroy our economy. And the final thing I'll say is this, that the carbon tax, I have said, there is a provincial carbon tax and federal carbon tax. Our provincial carbon tax, I've said we're going to scrap the carbon tax on all home heating fuels because it is a huge cost on British Columbians. And I've said we're going to make sure that we eliminate provincial fuel taxes. That's 15 cents a liter. We can do that the day after we're elected and we will because that's going to help save consumers money every time they fill up their car, truckers money when they're transporting goods like groceries around to all our stores, et cetera, reducing the inflationary pressures and giving families a break because families deserve a break right now. They are just being killed with taxes in British Columbia. So I'll stop there. That was a great question, Mike. Um, I got one, Kevin. Um, I've been in the business since 93. My wife and I have been, been the owners here since 05. And I have never seen so much political interference on three levels, federal, provincial, and civic in as, as it pertains to housing and cost. We're taxed up to yin yang, but I know we got three chefs in the kitchen and they all got different recipes, but you have a kitchen that can directly communicate to our city mayors and municipalities because we're talking about building all these homes and multi-zoning. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the simple inspectors and permits and staff to speed up the process, which is a huge delay. I live on the North Shore. I had a friend that waited almost 16 months to get permits for a home that the lot was in the millions. And so that carrying cost just adds to the end user when that transaction happens. Do you, do you have good communication with your city mayors about how you guys can play the same song and move things ahead quicker with less interference for our builders and not alone the, the provincial builders too? Because if it's going to be provincial uh, money going in for subsidized housing and private sector, they all got to dig the same holes. Yeah, well, this is this is a hugely important question. Everyone should know this. This is really important that you understand this. Municipalities are a creature of the province. That's a legal term. But we created them by legislation. Theoretically, government could uncreate them if they wanted to. Obviously, we wouldn't. But my point in saying that is that we have the ability to actually change how they make approvals and approve housing. I have been very clear with all the mayors. I'm not going to tolerate the kind of nonsense that sees it take years to get a simple housing project approved in a place like the district of North Vancouver. I, I can tell you when I was at Anthem, we had a project in the district of North Van on Mount Seymour Parkway. It was um, formerly um, a 100 strata titled townhomes. 
built in 1969. We wanted to replace it. And their own OCP said, please come here and build. I'm using round numbers. I can't remember the exact numbers now, but I think it was almost 400 units of housing, right? So there'd be condos and rentals and all kinds of things. Anthem went in there and said, we'll, we'll do that. We'll actually do less than what you're calling for and put it forward. And they were strenuously opposed. The council had not approved a single private sector project in the two years that they had been there at that point. That is ridiculous, okay? I'm not going to allow that to happen. And I've been very clear with the mayors. I'm gonna be bringing in legislative change that streamlines the process of approval so that we get certainty and timeliness. Because Mike, you're absolutely right. When it takes years to get a project approved, all that carrying costs, you've got your equity returns you gotta to pay to your investors, you've got the debt you're paying on the financing of the land, all of that gets flowed through to the end users. And then to make it worse, you've got your property transfer tax, your vacant lot tax, you've got your PST, your GST, you've got you know uh, DCCs, CACs. The first page of any pro forma is all municipal and provincial uh, and to a lesser extent federal taxes. So this goes back to what I keep telling the NDP. Look, you guys, if you want housing to be more affordable, you got to make it less expensive. You got to stop adding all these costs. They don't understand that. They keep adding cost delays, new environmental requirements, new step code uh, requirements, all of which layers on more cost to the end consumer. And then the very same politicians go out there and say, gee, we're so concerned about affordable housing. Well, I'm tired of this discussion. So the only way it's going to change is if we move in a radically new direction. And the radically new direction is we're going to be stripping out costs. We're going to be making sure that the approval process is streamlined and happens quickly. And I'm going to uh, provide financial incentives to those communities that are doing a great job in getting housing. And there's going to be penalties for those that aren't, because I'm not going to allow outliers to sit there and think, well, someone else can build it. But, you know, we're just going to not do our bit here in the district of North Van or what I'm not picking on them. I'm just using them as an example. Uh, everyone's going to be doing their part. And I'm just not going to tolerate a situation where we're in the midst of the worst housing crisis we've ever seen. And yet we've got governments either pointing fingers at each other or a whole bunch of people that haven't got a clue what they're doing, which is what we have right now with Ravi Kalon, a guy that's having got five minutes experience in the housing business, trying to drive housing policy. And it's not going to work out. And that's why, you know, they all accuse me. They say, oh, he's a big developer. He worked for a big developer. Well, quite frankly, I don't think it's going to be the worst thing in the world to have somebody as premier that actually knows what they're doing and knows a little bit about housing. I think it might be a good thing. I can go and sit down with people like you, Michael. I understand the business immediately. I know exactly what's involved. we got a whole crew of people that they have to have people, you know, explain to them how the real estate uh, markets work and they still don't get the policies right. So that's a great question. Anybody else for a question? I've got a question. Uh, sorry, my camera's off, but just, uh, yeah, in a, in a setting that uh, doesn't permit it to be on. But uh, Leo here, and, you know, you've said some great things about reducing, you know, taxes on, on many different fronts from property transfer tax to gas prices to other things, which all sound amazing. I'm just curious, how are you planning to balance the budget with these tax cuts? Are there other types of taxes that you plan on bringing into the to the province or other ways of making up these these you know funds that are potentially lost from the removal of you know taxes well leo that's a really great question but you know one thing you have to understand don't ever buy into this idea that reducing taxes somehow is going to mean less money to government i mean when i first got elected and michael you'll remember this in 2001 what was the very first thing we did as a bc liberal government on day one in the legislature was we reduced property taxes across the board by 25%, okay? Very first thing we did. And people were stunned. They couldn't believe it. They, the NDP went crazy. They said, oh my God, they're, they're, they're gonna have no money in government. We said, no, no, we're gonna be fiscally responsible. We're gonna get spending back under control, but we're putting more money back in people's pockets. Why? Because we had the highest income tax rates in North America under the ND, after 10 years of the NDP government, 50 3.4%, if my memory serves me correct, is what they were the day we cut them by 25%. Today in BC, top tax rate, 53.5%. They've done it again. We're right back up to amongst the highest in the country. And the problem with that is, I keep trying to tell this, but they don't understand, is that you know rich people are rich for a reason. They're not stupid. They find ways to get around high taxes. They set up corporations. 
and they'll dividend their their money out instead of taking it out as income or they set up family trusts or they move their offices to Alberta or whatever they figure it out um we have to understand track record is really important Leo so when I talk about eliminating taxes it's based on somebody that was part of a government that did exactly that and you should also know that my first job in government was actually to reduce red tape by one third in our first three years that was another commitment we made to the public of BC that was actually my first job my first ministerial job in government we exceeded the target it was a 42 percent reduction now why is that important well because this government loves regulation red tape but is killing business you you may have seen me on global tv recently at a lula's restaurant on commercial drive where they were fined ten thousand dollars because people were dancing in a greek restaurant like what is wrong with these people do they not know that the whole idea of a greek restaurant is that you have late night dinners and you drink and dance right uzo that's part of the fun um this is a no fun government but those kind of penalties and that sort of attitude is what is making it really tough to do business here so leo the the bottom line is there's government right now is wasting so much money on wasteful spending and i i could like i could spend 10 minutes here just on their stupid spending but i'll just give one example so you know what i'm talking about um you've all probably had the misfortune of driving through the massey tunnel the Massey Tunnel was built in the late 50s, okay? The BC Liberal government, my old government, back in 2015 said, we're going to build a new crossing here. They went out. They got quotes from some of the best companies across the country and around the world. They came in, they had a fixed price contract for $2.6 to build a 10-lane bridge, okay? Now, the government, because we were smart when we were in government, we de-risked these projects. And by that, I mean we went ahead and did spent $100 million moving the power lines, preloading the, the soil, getting all the environmental permits so that basically the bidders only have to build the bridge. And that's that's called de-risking a project. So $100 million had been spent. They had a fixed price contract, but unfortunately the election happened. The NDP got elected. The, the successful bidding consortium said to the government, we will hold these prices, the steel prices for 90 days. Will you make your decision? Which was very generous of them to, to, to do they thought for sure the government would say yes it was an amazing deal the government said no they walked away from it that 10 lane bridge just so you know two lanes would have been dedicated for buses four lanes in each direction for for cars and traffic widening of the entire 99 all the way through to surrey and on the vancouver side new interchange dramatic new interchange and it was designed and engineered to allow for skytrain to go from the bridgeport skytrain station to south surrey in the future they turned it all down then they waited years i started making noise as the official opposition leader saying what what the hell are you guys doing like that it would have been open last year for goodness sakes we could have been all seeing the benefits of it so then they said oh we're going to build an eight lane tunnel to replace the existing tunnel and the problem with their idea is two lanes will be dedicated for buses that's three lanes in each direction for traffic which is exactly the number of lanes that you have today when the counter flow is working in your favor imagine that they're going to take seven years longer, spend billions of dollars more to get the same number of lanes that we have today. That's only one example, Leo, but it's an example of the kind of ridiculous, wasteful spending that's going on in this government right now. Money that if we just spent it more smartly, we could absolutely fund these tax cuts and tax reductions, give families a break so that they're not living in the most expensive province in the country and be more like Alberta, where they've got lower taxes lower housing prices, lower everything. And I don't want to see our young people fleeing to Alberta. I want them coming back to BC because everyone prefers to live here. It's just they can't afford to. Makes sense. Makes sense. So uh, Kevin, I got another question that I've been asked a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of times. We have this dock management program up and down the Sunshine Coast. I have many friends that have second generation homes up there and they're, and they're, they're feeling they're feeling threatened that their docks are going to be taken away um, and they have no say in the matter. And then it pulls over to the proposed uh, First Nations Lands Act, which I understand there has to be a cooperation with with the province and First Nations on what to do with the crown land. But the dock management program is not only on the Sunshine Coast, it's going up rivers, inlets, it's going to go to lakes all through this province. And our current government said that the proposed uh, First Nations Lands Act is going to be shelved until this election comes up. And then I think whatever happens, it's going to ugly its, its head again. But the dock management program 
was not even mentioned. And there's no dialogue between these concerned residents and great people about their own personal backyards. What do you have to say to that? Well, first of all, I'd say it's an excellent question. It's something you should all be paying attention to as realtors, because this uh, will have massive implications in the province. So first of all, the dock management plan. I got wind of this uh, a couple of months back when we started hearing from residents who were being shut out of a conversation where the NDP government had entered into an arrangement with the Seashell First Nation, uh, and but had everyone sign confidentiality agreements so nobody in the public knew what was going on. But essentially what they did is enter into, uh, it, it, it would appear, a joint decision-making authority that would authorize the First Nation to have decision-making over people's docks. And then it tied into changes they wanted to make that would say, you know, you've got to rip out some of these docks, many of which, by the way, have been there for literally generations. Uh, but the NDP have decided they're going to apply a new environmental standard based on science that's not even from Canada. It's from the United States, uh, which is problematic in itself. And there was no grandfathering. There's been no consultation. And people are really upset. And I, I remember doing a video on this a couple of months ago. And I said, you know, this is going to sound like a very obscure subject to many of you watching. But there's something going on in, in, in on Pender Harbor uh, affecting docks called the Dock Management Plan. But you should be concerned because this will have provincial implications. They're going to do this on every lake and every piece of waterfront in the entire province of British Columbia. So anyone that, that has docks or is using docks or what have you is going to be impacted. And in some cases, they're saying you have to tear out that dock and build a new one according to a very, very high standard that could easily run into $100,000. And there are lots of people on fixed income and seniors that that have been living in these places for decades that can't afford that kind of money. And so they're upset. So this is, turns out, I was correct. It was the sort of the canary in the coal mine, because then weeks later, we got a leaked document to a, a reporter, got a leaked document and wrote a story about what they're calling the Public Land Act changes. And here they were proposing to enter into agreements with 200,000 First Nations from 204 bands across the province to provide joint decision-making. And just so you know, uh, joint decision-making is effectively a veto because what that means is if one of the partners says, well, we don't agree with that decision, it doesn't it doesn't go ahead. Why does that should that concern you? Because 95% of our land in British Columbia is crown land or, or we wanna rename it public land to emphasize the public nature of that land. But anything that happens on the land whether it's skiing, snowboarding, trapping, hunting, launching a boat, whatever the case may be, all requires some form of tenure. And those tenures are uh, approved by the provincial government because it's on crown land and they renew those tenures, et cetera. Now, if you have joint decision-making, that means that the minister responsible for the Public Land Act is required by legislation to make those decisions in the public interest. That includes indigenous and non-indigenous concerns. You take them all into account, you make a decision. By transferring that authority and saying, we're gonna share that authority, uh, this is not an anti-First Nations thing. They would do the right thing for their own communities as we would expect them to do. The problem is it severs the, the democratic accountability that you have with your provincially elected uh, MLAs and ministers to say, I don't agree with that decision. And because I don't agree, I want to vote you out next election. That's how you have control over what's happening. But once that that shared decision making is also in the hands of another group that you have no recourse to, you cannot change or influence their decisions because they'll make the decisions in their own best interest as they should, because they're a first nation. They've got uh, a more um, perhaps a narrower set of interests or maybe even a broader set, but they will be making that decision in their own interests as they see them. And there will be no recourse for 95% of the public to be able to get back and say, uh, we, we disagree with that decision. So the fundamental principle and the reason why we opposed it and we're getting out and speaking about it and doing town halls and talking to people is because we can't have a situation where less than 5% of the population is making decisions that impact 95% of public lands. We just simply can't allow that to happen. And so the NDP, as the chorus of opposition was building, you're correct, Michael, what they did is they they said, oops, because they were planning they were planning on jamming this through this spring session. They acknowledged that. They, they had a, a, a so-called engagement process that they didn't tell anyone there was an engagement process. So no one knew if that reporter hadn't reported out and come across this obscure website where they were doing this quiet engagement, we might not even know about it today, and it would have been introduced in the legislature 
in the next week or two, and they would have jammed it through using their majority. Fortunately, we got wind of it. We started making a lot of noise about it. Opposition started to grow, and the NDP panicked because there's an election in eight months. And so they said, okay, we're going to temporarily pull that. We're not going to introduce it this session. We'll do further consultations, which means they're going to kick it off and hope they win re-election, and then they'll bring it back. Because I know they've already made this commitment to First Nations. They've already said we're going to provide you with that veto power. And, and uh, I can guarantee you that they will follow through on that. So that is of grave concern to me, not, not just as a politician, just as a parent of kids that are going to be growing up in this province. And I don't want to see a situation where we're ceding that kind of provincial authority to groups that we have no recourse to. The, the, the dock management program that is, that is staying on the shelf, from what I'm hearing from people up and down the coast and, and get ready, you guys that live on the lakes and the rivers that have land there too, is the the current government's not even answering questions. It's not even taking meetings. It's like we work for them. And it's and these people that, that live up and down here, half of them don't even understand what's going on because there is no communication. It's gone so sneaky and so offside that I can't understand why our tax dollars are, are hiring these people in government to, to do this to us. And that needs to be addressed because, because once it starts to snowball effect, who owns the land? Who is, is it we're gonna be on lease land at some point in time? But anyway, thank you for answering the question. I hope that you have a voice to help these guys with, with, the, with their docks up and down the coast on the rivers and in, and in the lakes of BC to protect what they have and what they cherish. Absolutely. It's a, it's a huge issue. It's private property rights. There's a whole bunch of issues wrapped up into this, but the common denominator on so many of these things is the lack of consultation. It is really brutal. The government keeps doing this over and over. I can give you multiple examples. There's the parents of autistic kids where they tried to change the entire funding formula that we had brought in while we were in government, which was individualized funding. And they tried to do that without consulting with the people impacted. Or if they did consult with them, they would make them sign non-disclosure agreements so they couldn't talk about it. Like, it's really brutal. That's not how you should operate a government. And uh, anyhow, I, Michael, I'm coming to the end of my time here. So if you don't mind, I'll just make a few closing comments if I could. Go right ahead. Okay. I just want to say to all of you, um, thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know what it's like when you're busy in your work stuff. You don't have time to think about politics much. I just really want you to understand how much it actually impacts your livelihood. It really does. And the decisions being made here, whether it's tax, regulatory, uh, misguided housing policies that aren't going to work, et cetera, they're all going to impact you in a, in a very serious way. So it's important that you get involved and be involved. Sometimes that involvement might just be following me on social media, you know, because that's actually a way that you can, you know, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook or, or you know, twi Twitter. None of you are probably on Twitter. But my point is you can you can do that. And that's actually a way of helping out. Um, but do think about the next election and look around in your respective ridings and look for that BC United candidate. We've got 26 opposition MLAs from every part of the province. Uh, but, you know, we, we want to make sure that we win over 50 seats so that we can form government. And the only way we'll do that is uh, by winning in every single one of the 93 ridings that are happening. And so I hope that uh, all of you will think about uh, supporting good candidates. I am very proud of not just our existing MLAs, but the new candidates we're attracting, doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, those with the real estate background, all kinds of, of individuals that are really first class quality individuals that will help us fix these problems and get BC back on track. So thank you, Michael. And, and uh, thank you all of you for taking part in this. And thanks, Michael Booth. Good to see you again. And I hope you all have a, a great, productive, profitable day, week, month, and years to come. Thank you, sir. And thank you again, Michael Booth, for organizing. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. And I'll, we'll let you go, Kevin. Take care. All the best to you and your family. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it.